making it happen is a little trickier. Yeah. I'll just tell you, it wasn't as hard as it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody needs to call you and say, hey, where did you find this pool? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, this is Ted Kelly with another Ted's Hospitality Minute. Hey, we've got a super great guest on. His name is Charles Oswald. He is the president and CEO of Aperture Hotels. He's going to come on and talk about all the great things that are going on over there, touch on a little bit about the industry and all of the great things that we think are going to happen for the remainder of 2024. Hey, Charles, how are you? Hey, great. It's good to see you, Ted. Oh, man, it was great to see you in Atlanta last week at the... Uh, at the Hunters Conference, man, that was a that was a nice little uh, unplanned event to bump into you there. That's right. You know, that was uh, I think that was the best Hunter Conference ever, actually. Um, lots of uh, I think lots of activity is going to come out of that. And uh, hey, and we had good times, too. Right. Uh, visiting over there at the Tabernacle, uh, where I think we closed down the party and uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> we made the most yes. of it. So good seeing you. Yeah. Yeah, so kudos to the Wyndham folks for throwing a, a great party and kudos to the band because I think the band was truly awesome. Oh, <laughs> the best. That's right. <laughs> so, so, Charles, usually when we start our podcast with our audience, we usually like to give our guests an opportunity to just talk briefly about, you know, their experience. How did you get into the hospitality space? Was it always a dream or did it? By happenstance, how did you get into hospitality? Talk a little bit about it. You know, that's an <laughs> interesting question, right? Uh, so, so you know, initially I didn't have my uh, eyes set on hospitality. Uh, I thought I was going to Wall Street. And, uh, and then a friend called me uh, after I had just accepted a job with a big, uh, a big uh, finance company we'd all know uh, up there at Wall Street. And he said, uh, he asked about joining hospitality. I said, why do you want to do this? He says, man, he said, I come visit you where you're working at the Hyatt Regency there. And, uh, and you know, I see business people having a great time at the bar, uh, people at the front uh, desk and, and the team at the hotel looks happy. We walked back to the ballroom and people were dancing and having a great time. He says, you work in a happy place. He says, that's where I want to work. And so at the end of the day, I actually hung up the phone. I turned down the job that I had to go to Wall Street and decided I was going to advance my career in hospitality because I just wanted to be a happy, you know, work in a happy place. Uh, so uh, so I put in uh, for a, uh, a transfer with uh, in a promotion with uh, with Hyatt and um, uh, in my food and beverage career blossomed from there, uh, moving up through, you know, from cook to to you know, convention services and banquet management and food and beverage management and so on until eventually AGM and general manager of uh, full service properties. And then, uh, uh, and then, and then, you know, Noble Investment Group gave me my first break to, to, to into the multi-unit management world uh, where I became a regional director and a vice president of operations overseeing um, uh, operations for Mitch Shaw's Noble Investment Group out of, uh, out of, out of Atlanta. Uh, and then one thing led to another uh, th through the sale of that group and um, into uh, interstate hotels and resorts when they sold the management over there. Um, I briefly worked with interstate before uh, uh, becoming the CEO and a partner of HP Hotels, uh, where uh, I ran that business and we, we developed it up to just shy of 50 hotels uh, uh, at its peak. Uh, so, you know, the pandemic created a transition for a lot of us, uh, where I actually stepped out in some other commercial real estate ventures and uh, had, a, had a great time, very good learning opportunity before, uh, before coming back here to uh, uh, Aperture Hotels. Uh, and so we just launched this about a year ago at the Hunter Conference and it's going really well so far. Wow, that is awesome. What a great story. So it, it's all hospitality. You turned down the finance job and you did hospitality from there on, it sounds like. Yeah, I don't know. You know, it, it's the hard way uh, for sure. It was the hard road, uh, but it's fun. I love what I do. I love working with people, I love developing them. Um, and I mean, you, you really, on this side of the business, you can make a meaningful difference in people's lives. And that's just something that's so important to me and so important to our culture here at Aperture Hotels. Absolutely. And you know what? The interesting thing is, you know, with hospitality, you either love it or you hate it. Right. So you either in or you're out. That's right. <laughs> and if you hate it, yeah, move out. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> but talk a little bit about Aperture. Tell us a little bit more about that. What, what all is there? What do you guys do? What are you trying to do? It sounds like you guys have got some great momentum going over there. Talk a little bit about Aperture. Sure. Um, so Aperture is a third party hotel management company, right? So uh, so we typically manage for sophisticated private equity firms, uh, their family office, uh, sophisticated individuals. Um, and, you know, we've set up an, an institutional grade uh, management company that can uh, deliver all those professional services that uh, one needs for day-to-day -day operations. So all the employees of all the hotels are, are ours here at Aperture Hotels. Um, we're managing for about a, what, a half dozen different owners now. And um, in the course of a year, you know, I, I'm thankful to my uh, friends at Story Collective who uh, contributed the first portfolio of properties that helped us get started uh, a year ago it was Aperture Hotels. And, um, uh, and with that, we were able to, uh, you know, build on a foundation and go out and seek and pursue other third party management contracts. Um, so that has now grown to a portfolio of 24 properties as we stand here today. Uh, and those properties range from um, upscale select service brand properties uh, like, you know, Hampton Inns and Fairfield Inns on through garden Inns and courtyards and on up into um, uh, boutique and independent properties. Uh, there's, you know, lifestyle properties, uh, compact full service. Uh, we have a, a, you know, a small ski lodge up uh, in the Lake Tahoe area. Uh, so we're now sitting at these 24 properties ranging from the Florida beaches to the California uh, coast, uh, the mountains and up north into the, uh, into the Midwest. So, uh, so, so we're, we're pretty, pretty geographically diversified. Wow, that is awesome. Now, tell me a little bit about the industry. Are you seeing, you know, what challenges are you seeing still for the industry kind of in a post-COVID mode? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think the, um, the key challenges that persist in the industry right now is, uh, you know, there, there's the financing, right? We all know that uh, uh, interest rates are going to be higher for longer. Um, debt service for many hotels has doubled, and that's been a real challenge. So there's so there's financing, uh, insurance. We've seen, uh, especially if you're in coastal markets like you know from Florida to California, we're seeing uh, uh, hearing about rates that have gone up uh, 200, even 300 percent. Um, and I'll just add that uh, you know a company like ours, it's got that geographic diversity with properties from. Uh, you know, Florida to Wisconsin to Texas to California, you know, diverse geographic dispersion can really benefit insurance rates for hotel owners. So you should, that's something you should be looking for in a management company. Um, other challenges, of course, the labor uh, issues uh, um, are, 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 are huge in our industry. Um, and, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, working in a market where there's two and a half million more job openings across the United States than there are actual unemployed individuals. Um, uh, beyond that, you know, there's the, there's the issue that, uh, you know, the 2024 and beyond U.S. top line forecast growth is projected uh, at something that's at or slightly above CPI. Uh, so if you have rising laser costs and those kind of challenges that you're confronting along with insurance and financing, that can lead to diminishing margins um, uh, for, for, for many owners. So I think those are the top uh, four, what did I write a lot, five issues that the industry is facing today. Yeah. What do you what are your thoughts on the renovation piece? I know the brands gave a lot of the owners kind of a pass during COVID uh, to not have to execute on a PIP. And for all of the reasons that you described would be more reasons why they would probably still want to say, hey, can I have a little bit more time on trying to get this PIP done? Because, you know, from an economy standpoint, it's not really favorable to do it. But what what's your take on how to get the, the PIP situation squared away with some of the, the brand. Oh, that's a big issue for sure. And um, the issue is, is that uh, particularly a lot of, of those uh, hotels that were acquired back in 18, 19 or rolling into early 20 um, is that, you know, we saw that dip uh, in performance during the pandemic. Um, and for various reasons, whether a, an owner had not yet executed their property improvement plans according to the 
uh, their initial business plan when they first acquired the properties. Um, uh, before, you know, they, they then ran into supply chain issues. You started running into finance issues. Um, you had challenges where uh, maybe your hotel wasn't uh, achieving its debt service coverage ratio. And, uh, and so the lender may have locked up your, your FF&E reserve account uh, uh, until you could get you know, successive periods uh, of debt service coverage ratio under your belt. And so with all these various challenges in mind, um, uh, the, the cash uh, simply wasn't there to release. And so, so property improvement plans got postponed year upon year upon year upon year. And so we're sitting here now, we're looking back to PIPs that were due in 2019 and sometimes even earlier and in 2020, and we're going, wow, that was, that was you know, three and four and five years ago uh, that this was due. It's almost a whole PIP cycle, right? I mean, we, we typically like to see uh, soft good updates every six to seven years, case good updates every 12, 14, 15 years and, and, and construction updates and, and typically uh, franchise license extensions, major PIPs happen beyond that. And so you fall off the cycle where it's, it's been extended. Well, I think we're in a place where the brands um, in the interest of taking care of customers and enhancing customer experiences, they, they've got to enforce now those PIP standards that they had as a brand, right? And, and, uh, and becoming more consistent there. Uh, so a lot of people are having to make that tough call. What, what do I do? You know, they either have the money or they don't. If you have the money, you know, you want to, uh, what we're seeing is that um, those upper upscale properties in particular the, in that segment, but, but, but higher quality assets are outperforming their mar their, uh, the market and uh, in doing really well when they can deliver those great customer experiences, and, you know, and the fresh product. Um, so you want to be positioned that way and not be one of those vulnerable, tired properties out there. Um, and those owners who are stuck are now having to look at, you know, refinancing is coming due. Um, the cash flows maybe weren't there. The PIP is due. You can't get the money. So I think that's going to force transactions as we head into the latter half of this year uh, and into early 2025. Uh, people just make those tough decisions, and I and 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 then we'll see a lot of those pips. Uh, I believe we'll see a lot of those pips take place uh, as we press forward into uh, latter part of this year in 2025. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think it's a tough spot uh, for owners, especially maybe some of the smaller owners, to have to deal with because they just don't have favorable conditions to really work with. And then you're, you know, if they were located in the wrong area. And you're coming out of COVID, and they're still waiting for some of their uh, occupancy levels and revenues to return. They're they're really still stuck, like you said. It's a it's not a it's not a good place to be. So they got to look at other options on how they can can maybe figure out a path forward. So it's it's not a, an easy way. Yeah, that's right. You know, and and along those lines, I mean, you know, it, it's also it's been an uneven recovery. Uh, you know, a lot of people read the headlines and they say, well, wow, hotel business is doing well, right? Um, and gosh, if you were sitting at a leisure property on the beach and ski mountains and places where people wanted to go and near Disney, you know, through 2022, yeah, you had a banner year. It was the, it was the top. It was the best on record in history. Um, uh, but if you were sitting, you know, holding a, a, a corporate business uh, property or a convention hotel in 2022, uh, you had a very different story to tell. So, so recovery has been uneven, um, uh, uh, according to the different segments uh, of the industry. Though we're starting to see that you know shift towards a, a recover in some of those those urban markets and those convention hotels now, as as, as more group business is picking up, and and, and that'll that that'll change. Uh, and then I would say there's also an unevenness that, you know, even not all, um, you know, urban and leisure markets are the same. You know, for example, uh, you know, if you're looking at Miami, Phoenix, Nashville, uh, their office, their office market's fine um, and urban markets are doing great. And so, you know, they, they're, they're, people are looking at like, what's the problem if you're standing in San Francisco or Philadelphia or uh, San Jose, you have a different story to tell. You're like, wow. It's, it's still way down and we have a long way to go towards uh, towards recovery. So that unevenness, depending upon what your, you know, where, where your properties lie, um, uh, it, you know, it, it is part of the challenge. Right, right. 
Hey, Charles, I'm going to pause for a second. I got to give a word from my sponsor because if I don't, they won't sponsor us anymore, right? Hey. So let me, let, let, <laughs> me give them, let me give them a shout out. THM View is this episode is being sponsored by Recover It. If you've experienced a home fire, tornado, or other natural disaster, you know how easy it is to lose everything overnight. Well, Recover It's a new app. It allows you to record everything in your home, store it in the clouds for easy retrieval should disaster strike versus you trying to recall all of your household valuables, jewelry, et cetera, to settle your claims with your insurance company. Check out the Recover It app today. Use the promo code on screen and get 50% off. And as always, we like to remind our viewers, this episode with Charles will be on YouTube. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll also be posted here on LinkedIn, and it'll also be on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And we appreciate all of your comments and feedback on every episode. So don't hesitate to let us know. All right. Now, Charles, talk a little bit about, say, your your DEI efforts. What are you guys doing at Aperture in regard to DEI? Um, so our DEI effort, well, let me just back up here a little bit. Um, First of all, we work in a majority women industry. Um, that's just a matter of fact. However, when I walk around at some of these conferences, like where, where we just were today, um, I don't know if the ratio of men to women, it, six to one, eight to one, 10 to one, it, but it was a strong tilt towards you know favoring one group. And um, and so that is something we took to heart and really wanted to, to think Think hard about was was how can we make Aperture's leadership team more reflective of it, the demographics and its employment base. Uh, so with that said, we're very intentional about uh, about changing that mix uh, going forward. And uh, and we've I, I will tell you um, you know we're proud of our accomplishments. But today, as we stand here, uh, our general managers are fifty five percent women. Our executive leadership team, which is uh, all of our vice presidents and above, uh, up through my role, right, uh, is 56% women. And uh, our corporate office is 71% women. So that was a that was a big move for us. In addition, when we look at the leadership team, um, uh, you know, we're at 32% historically underrepresented groups, right, minorities and, and so on. That, that have been historically underrepresented. Uh, so we're proud of our achievements there and the fact that we made um, an, an impact in that area. And uh, and I would challenge uh, out there and say that there's there's a very small, no, I don't know if it's one or 2%, but a very, very small uh, number of uh, management companies in our industry that have succeeded at doing that. Yeah, right, right. And it, particularly being Women in History Month, that's a nice statistic that they're out there because there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of groups that I would think are not necessarily hitting those numbers, kind of like what you just stated. Yeah. And you know what, Ted, I, I thought it was going to be hard, uh, <laughs> but it wasn't that hard. I mean, the reality is there are so many talented people out there that have come up in the business and, uh, you know, maybe it was, um, uh, you know, family needs that uh, kind of got in the way at some point in their career development, or uh, it was, you know, it, it just might have been, uh, you know, some of the good old boy culture, or, or for whatever reasons, uh, they had a hard time bridging the gap into leadership. Uh, it, it was like, it was like pent up demand for a product, you know, here we were, we had this opening, and uh, there were all these people that were eager and, and hungry and had the right experience. We didn't have to lower our standards uh, to get there by any means. I would tell you, we got a top-notch team that I'm really proud of. Uh, and uh, it wasn't nearly so hard to do as some of my colleagues make it out to be. Wow. Well, kudos to you and your team for, uh, for recognizing that and actually moving on it. Because uh, sometimes I don't know that uh, the... The idea is there sometimes, but I don't know if the follow through happens, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Best intentions may exist, but sometimes making it happen is a little trickier. I'll just tell you, it wasn't as hard as it sounds. <laughs> well, everybody needs to call you and say, hey, where do you find this pool? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, so I, I guess that would lead me to 
you know, it's less about um, the word do you find, I mean, sure, you got to cast a broad net uh, in your hiring, uh, look a lot of candidates, uh, you know, side by side, you know, be, and if you're intentional and you think about it, uh, you'll find that there, 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 there is talent out there. But overall, whether we're addressing this or any other labor challenge, I think that it, you know, there's probably, there's five things that we have to keep in mind, right? Um, uh, if you're going to succeed in overcoming the labor challenges that we have out there, um, you got to be a little bit more flexible. Uh, you got to two, you got to be adaptable. You know, three, you got to uh, have the right culture and engagement. Um, you know, four, you have to be committed, uh, I think, to skills and career development. And 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 five, uh, you have to have um, uh, a priority a priority of employee well being. And if you can do those five things and establish that in your organization. Uh, you know, you'll be successful in overcoming the labor challenge. Yeah, and and I think you're you're spot on there. And I actually got a chance to to look at some of those uh, those five tenets that you just mentioned. And and one that jumped out at me was the fact that you were thinking about, or should I say, you were doing where your operations team folks could actually do four hour shifts or four day shifts of ten hours. Did I did I read that right? Uh, yeah. There, so. So, for example, um, you know, we have a couple of hotels where uh, there might be an airline crew, right? And airline crews come into the hotels uh, at sometimes odd hours uh, with their contract. They might arrive later in the day or earlier in the day, just depending upon, uh, you know, those scenarios. And we found that there is a, a demand out. There are people out there who have a full-time job and maybe they just need like four extra hours a day. Uh, to make ends meet. They might live in a high cost city like San Francisco. Uh, and and if we can create uh, those positions where we're cleaning rooms when we need it, then it works. And, and the fact is that, uh, for example, in one of, you know, in some of our markets, uh, you know, we may have a specific contract business that checks out later in the day and the cleaning needs to occur later in the afternoon. And all of those guys that have worked their customary eight hour shifts, uh, rather than us carrying those rooms and dealing with the next day, uh, we now can adapt our, our business plan to match up to some of the employee needs. Uh, so that's uh, that's an example. And in a couple of cases we have, you know, we tested the four day work week, the 10 hour shifts and uh, uh, you know, and and and, and, uh, and we've even we've even worked with uh, some of the hybrid work uh, models uh, when it comes to sales. Yeah, I, th I think that's really cool. And I think, you know, to your point, I think you just got to be receptive to a new model. You know, you want to get the job done, you got to be receptive to, you know, what what's the new model look like, or let's create a model that works for the folks that we're trying to attract. Because obviously, the old model is not working anymore. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. If you keep uh, falling back into doing the same old thing that you always did, right, you get the same old thing you always got and uh, you'll never uh, you, you, you'll never fill those open positions. Yeah. So so talk a little bit about you guys recent success. You guys are growing leaps and bounds. I just read a press release where you got the 12 for 12. I'm sitting there going like, man, these guys are rolling. What's going on over there, man? <laughs> well, I'll tell you when. So when we launched Aperture Hotels last year, um, I was a little bit, I was a little concerned about our timing. I know at some point that acquisitions and transactions were going to occur, but um, uh, there was some concern that, that, that most management contracts shift at the point of acquisition. And that transaction market had slowed substantially, right, with the higher financing uh, uh, higher interest rates and the, uh, uh, and the challenges in getting hotel financing. Um, uh, and, and there was a big gap between uh, buyer and seller expectations regarding the price of an asset when they went to acquire. So with all that said, uh, uh, you know, I'm like, wow, I'm trying to launch this new third party management initiative. And, and it seems like every deal that we focus on, um, you know, they, in many cases, they didn't even trade. Uh, ultimately, the seller said, I'm not getting the price that the market wants. The markets, you know, can't, can't pay that much and be in negative leverage. So, so the deals weren't going through. But then what happened is we realized that that financial pressure um, that owners were facing 
uh, you know, all the stuff we talked about before, interest rates, insurance, uh, rising labor costs and so on, it caused asset managers to take uh, a closer look into their P&Ls and ask, is the manager that I have today actually delivering everything they should? Are they doing the best uh, at managing my property? Are they uncovering the hidden business potential in this asset? And so as they did that, um, some asset managers decided, you know what, uh, we're not getting the most, we're not maximizing the operational results here. And so um, we need to look for a change. So all 12 of those assets came through management company churn. None of them were acquisitions, which is unbelievable. It's just unheard of. That's not um, what we've historically seen in our industry. Uh, so, so it was just people looking for an upgrade. Now, in this case, um, all of them were either somebody that um, I had prior experience working with at one of my uh, prior companies. Uh, and so they came on that reputation and, uh, and, and past experience being good and where we deliver results uh, in, before and they want to see it again, or they were referred by somebody that I knew. Uh, and so that's been, that's, that also is a great story uh, in that, you know, th these are, these are relationships as a relationship industry and we're building on those relationships. Uh, so, so, so we're very proud of that. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I thought that was just a great, uh, a great press release. And, uh, I love the title of 12 for 12. That's, that's pretty. Yeah. Funny. Yeah. Yeah. It went really well. You know, so, so I'll tell you just a funny story. I said, so, uh, as we did the press release and we were walking around at Hunter, I had a 13th contract come in and, uh, <laughs> And so, so, so we executed that 13th project, um, uh, contract. We're, we're going to be uh, moving into uh, a property in Austin. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and so I was, I was there with Chris Daly, who does some of our, our press releases. And, uh, and I was like, Chris, do we, do we update? He's like, you want me to update this? I was like, I don't know. 12 to 12 just, for 12 just sounds so good. Let's just stick with our story as it is right now. We'll add this in the next year. <laughs> <laughs> We'll get it in there. <laughs> and, and, and technically, we were one day past our one year anniversary. So I guess it's part of next year. <laughs> but the pipeline is uh, robust and they keep coming in. So that's the, that's well, the good thing. Well, yeah. kudos to you guys. Congrats to you and your team over there. Keep up the good work. Um, like I shared earlier, you know, to your point about the transactions slowing down. Uh, from our standpoint, you know, being in the PIP space and the major maintenance capex, we need owners that are spending money for our stuff to go right. <laughs> so, if uh, if they're slowing up on the money, then we're slowing up on our work. So, trying to get our pipeline full is a little bit different right now while we wait for the transactions to pick up. But you know, we think it's going to get better toward the end of the year and into twenty five. So we'll uh, we'll we'll keep riding close and and watching watching you guys. <laughs> for certain. Yeah, for certain it, it will. And uh, I will tell you that some of that is starting to uh, turn the corner. Uh, we're underwriting several deals uh, with different owners right now as we speak uh, to put in bids for new acquisitions. So uh, there seems to be a little bit more uh, new energy. Uh, and when I talk about this last Hunter conference being uh, being a great one, uh, just to give you an example, um, an asset, a hotel asset today is likely worth more than it was one year ago, right? Um, that is to say that economic conditions uh, have continued to gradually improve. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, the cap rates have gone up today versus where they were a year ago. Uh, even though we're also a step closer to seeing um, you know, a decline in interest rates, uh, you know, as the Fed has continued to uh, allude to. So uh, what does that tell you? That's a closing of, of the gap between the buyer and seller expectations. And I think we're in a place where transactions can now begin to actually occur uh, and, and uh, you know, as we go forward. So, yeah, I hope to uh, get you busy. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think things will get better. I think they'll get better. We just got to Toe the line, right? Toe the line. <laughs> All right. Well, Charles, hey, I appreciate you giving us a few minutes of your time today, man. It's been great. It's been great chatting with you as always. Uh, I think our audience gets a lot from conversations with guys like yourself and kind of your outlook on the industry and what things are going on. Is there anything, 
anything coming up over at Aperture that you want our audience to be on the lookout for or some, some special event that you want to let them know? Um, no particular, uh, special events. Uh, I would just say that, uh, you know, keep us in mind if, uh, you happen to be one of those groups that's facing those challenges, um, in, in, you know, op with the operational improvement, uh, uh, or, or maybe someone who can help you overcome those insurance challenges and so on. Uh, we'd love to be there for you. We want to be your trusted advisor. Uh, from the beginning to the end, you know, from the point of acquisition uh, out to the point of disposition. So, uh, uh, aperturehotels.com. All right, cool. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks again. Hey, uh, this has been another Ted's Hospitality Minute. Please check us out on LinkedIn, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and this episode with Charles will be on Apple Podcasts and Spotify shortly. And as always, we appreciate your feedback. Again, this is the Ted Hospitality Minute. We'll see you next time. You guys have a great week. Ted's Hospitality Minute is sponsored by Recover It. Don't wait for disaster to happen to wish you had done this.